Yes. Quick recap. Welcome to de Demystifying Academic Job Interviews. Um, Kate, I guess we should probably introduce ourselves first. Uh, well, I'm Jessica Schleider. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Stony Brook University in the clinical psych doctoral program there. Hi, and I'm Kate Humphreys. I'm a clinical psychologist by training as well. I'm in the Department of Psychology and Human Development at Vanderbilt University. Um, and my area of expertise is infant mental health. Ah, uh, yes. My area of expertise is uh, developing scalable mental health interventions, dissemination, implementation science, intervention science, uh, not infants. <laughs> okay. So quick agenda, like the good CBT trained therapists we are. Um, I suppose we've already expressed that it is very nice to meet you. Um, we're going to be discussing applying for academic jobs, kind of an overview of how the process works um, overall. We're going to be talking about what interviews are actually for and helpful things to keep in mind as you're going through that process. Um, specifically separating out screening and on-campus interviews because they're two separate phases of the process and serve somewhat different purposes uh, when you're on the academic job hunt what to do after you interview, both post-screening interview and post on-campus interviews, and then a lot of Q&A. Um, and we're going to hopefully leave plenty of time for that because so much of this process is kind of a, a hidden curriculum, so to speak. Um, and so I, I do find that that open discussion with, with folks is some of the most helpful ways uh, to prepare. Um, Again, it is really nice to meet you all. Um, we already introduced ourselves, but here's a little bit more information about both of us. So just the perspectives that we're coming in with for this workshop and discussion. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor on the tenure track at Stony Brook University. I'm currently just finishing up my second year in my current position. So I was on the job market uh, from 2017 to 2018. And I applied for academic positions on the tenure track while I was doing clinical internship. Um, and something to keep in mind potentially for Q&A, um, we had different experiences in a few different ways, but I actually interviewed for jobs in very different kinds of departments. So not just clinical psych where I ended up, but also social work, school psychology and counseling psychology. Um, so if any, anybody has questions about applying across disciplines or types of schools, um, feel free to ask them. I'll also note that I was uh, doing a geographically restricted job search when I hunted. So um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to field those as well. Oh, and I'll jump in. I, um, I went on the job market the year before, Jessica. Um, I actually just applied to one dream program. Uh, so that's kind of limited in that specific experience. My plan was to go the following year because um, I had a partner who was geographically restricted when I was applying. Um, I had been planning to apply to clinical and developmental positions um, and I ended up asking for a deferral. Um, so I'm on the same time scale that Jessica is. I just finished my second year um, on the tenure track. Okay. Um, and just per our knowledge and experiences, we're going to be focusing on interviewing for tenure track psychology jobs at PhD granting institutions. You might have heard these referred to before as R1 institutions, which are research intensive places. Um, so that's just giving you some background. We won't be able to focus on all types of universities and jobs, liberal arts colleges, research to universities, master's granting institutions, comprehensive colleges, you name it. Um, we're happy to try to field questions about those if you have them, but just wanted to give you a sense of where we're going to be focusing. Okay, so what does the overall process look like for actually applying for academic tenure track jobs in academia? Well, it starts really early and goes for a long time. <laughs> so the job application process usually starts in June or July. Um, so to give you a sense of my timeline, I started my clinical internship in July. And that is also when I started applying for academic jobs. <laughs> um, so it's a very early start. Um, and this is sort of when the market opens up when you first start to see postings. Um, but it's, it's a while before all of the postings will be finalized potentially until November or December of the same year. In July and August, that's the time where you're really going to be wanting to focus on preparing your materials for your applications. Uh, preparing your CV, which of course you are likely to have been preparing already over the years in graduate school uh, and postdoc. Uh, writing your research, teaching and diversity statements, obtaining letters, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in just a minute. 
From September through December is when most deadlines are. For me, the earliest deadline was a rolling deadline that opened up in August, and the latest deadline was sometime in November. So there's a really wide window, um, but there's no reason to wait to submit your applications unless you're waiting for um, uh, you know, decisions about a grant that might significantly impact your CV, or, or you wanna wait until the latest possible point because of publication timing, et cetera. Um, from September through November, that's when you might have screening interviews. Now, not all universities do screening interviews, um, but many do. I had them in the majority of cases, although for the job I ended up taking, I did not have a screening interview. They skipped straight to the on-campus stage. But some factors like uh, the amount of money and funding that the department has to interview multiple people will influence that decision. From October through February, um, that's when on-campus interviews tend to happen. There's kind of a lull in winter break time um, because nobody's on campus. Um, so most of them will be congregated right around Thanksgiving <laughs> um, and then maybe with a, a, another burst uh, after the new year. So anywhere between December and April, which is a wonderfully vague time period, that's when offers, negotiations, and decisions happen. And even better, none of this happens in any fixed order. So you might get an offer before you're finished with your interviews. Um, you might be negotiating one position while you're still not positive about what's going to happen with another one that you really want. It's all a lot of fun, and I <laughs> urge you to uh, rely on your mentors very, very much. Um, they're going to be uh, key to your uh, ability to guide this process. It's really difficult, so outsource all that coping um, if you can do so. And I'll, I'll note too that a lot of the time it's appropriate and logical um, to apply for postdoctoral positions at the same time as you're applying to faculty jobs. The timelines for these are nicely spaced. That's one convenient feature of this process. So usually the job ads for tenure track positions will come out um, you know, from July through October and November, but the postdoc ads tend to pop up around November, December, and January, and all the way into April, uh, because a lot of them are contingent on grants that, um, you know, get funded in the spring, let's say. So, um, you may be able to, uh, you know, pursue your tenure track academic job applications, and then once you're done with those, pivot to submitting some postdoc applications as well so that you have the most possible options for yourself. But you can absolutely do both simultaneously if you have the time, you know, and it, there is a real trade-off with the time and effort and energy this takes, um, but it's something to consider. We today are going to be focusing most of our time on screening and on-campus interviews. Um, there are wonderful resources for the other pieces of this uh, job application puzzle, and we'll touch on those briefly, but this is where we're going to be focusing. So what are you actually preparing over the summer proceeding when you apply for tenure track positions? Your application package uh, consists of a pretty predictable set of documents um, that may or may not vary all that much um, uh, from one position to the next. I say may or may not because if you're applying for positions in very different kinds of schools or departments, you may want to tailor some of your materials. But if you're applying for all R1 positions in clinical science programs, for example, they can probably be pretty consistent across places. Your research statement is three to four pages describing your research program, not just what you've done, but what you're going to do. As your future department is not hiring you based on what you have done, they will hire you based on your potential for producing in the future. Your teaching statement, which is one or two pages about your teaching philosophy. Your diversity statement, which is not required by it's, it's increasingly required by places. Um, that describes how you've um, acted on your commitment to diversity, both in your teaching and your research, and the ways in which you hope to uh, continue to contribute to that area in your new position. Your CV, um, won't go into detail there. Um, uh, your cover letter, one per position, this can be almost the, you know, the same based on the place you're applying to, with some tailoring um, to you know, here, different faculty you want to work with at this school versus that school, um, or different initiatives in one university versus another that are particularly of interest to you. And if you have a geographical um, connection to a particular place, this is a good place to highlight that in yeah. your 
um, you know, expressing enthusiasm for living in Nashville or, or wherever the um, job is located. Right. And I think that's especially important when you're applying to places that aren't a major metropolitan area on one of the coasts, because saying you have a tie to the New York area is not all that unique. Um, <laughs> so um, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so on the right, just some extra resources, since we're not going to spend a lot of time on these pieces of your application, some slides from a social psychologist and professor at NYU, Jay Van Babel. Um, he has some really nice resources on how to prep these materials. Sample research and teaching statements, advice from a blog that I find very useful for um, thinking about how to apply to the academic job market. Um, and of course, ask for feedback on materials and examples from as many colleagues as will provide them to you. Uh, both Kate and I have linked to our full application packages that we use for our current positions at the end of our slides. So you all can access them um, and see how we went about framing our program of, of research and teaching. Okay, what are interviews actually for? Well, um, first of all, they're not great. <laughs> they're a very biased way of evaluating people and that's been documented over and over again. And yet they persist and they are still very heavily leaned on in terms of selecting who's going to be in, you know, offered a position. Um, so despite these um, challenges with interviews, um, they're very important to figure out how to approach them and navigate them. What they allow people to do, uh, specifically the search committee to do, is to obtain information that's not immediately available through your CV, through your journal articles, or through letters of recommendation. Um, and that includes things like how you talk about and think about your own research program, where you see it going in the future, and how you might fit into the department. Um, whether there's somebody that you that they want to spend potentially 20 plus years being a colleague with. Uh, so your personality for better or worse is a big part of this. And by the same token, you'll be assessing their personalities and seeing whether this is somewhere that you would feel comfortable pursuing a career. And your interests, they're, they're really gauging your interest in being there. Um, you know, with um, graduate school applications, it's very similar uh, as, as with job applications. Uh, professors who are interviewing you for graduate positions want to know that their lab is the place you want to be, right? It's the same exact thing with interviewing for academic jobs. Uh, these departments want to feel like they're your top choice. They want to feel like this is the perfect place that can really nurture your growth and development. Um, of course, part of the interview process is assessing yourself if that is the case, but that is what they're looking for simultaneously. So there are a, a few different ways to prepare for interviews, some more distal than others. Uh, perhaps the most distal possible way that you can per start pursuing at any point during graduate school and or postdoc um, is attending job talks. So both in your department and in related areas or, 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 or departments. So if you're in clinical, um, I would encourage you to um, you know, seek out opportunities to attend job talks in cognitive psych or social psych or areas that even remotely intersect with your area of study. Um, and sometimes it's even more helpful to go to talks in areas where you're not all that familiar because you can really get a sense of who did a good job at making their program of research accessible and interesting and exciting um, because that's really the goal of the job talk. Um, and I would encourage you to go, if you can, um, with an advisor or a trusted colleague or a mentor and talk to them afterwards about how it went, what they liked, what you liked, what went well and not well. Really reflecting on that can help you think about your own research program and how you might shape it in the future. More proximal interview prep, um, as you're applying for jobs, that kind of June through, um, you know, September, October timeline, just research each institution and department. If it's a clinical program, are they more clinical science, scientist practitioner, practitioner scholar? What is their orientation and how would you fit into that? What is their mission? Are they very social justice oriented, for example? And is that something that you really need to center and highlight in your application materials? For me, applying to um, you know, programs in social work and counseling psychology versus clinical science programs, that was something that I highlighted to a greater or lesser degree, depending on where I was applying and interviewing. Um, you know, how will your expertise fit into their academic landscape? Do they need to fill a need or a gap in their department? Do they not have a lot of child-focused people? Or do they not have a lot of, I don't know, depression-focused researchers in their area? 
The in-depth interview prep comes before you know you're definitely going to get, you're, you're, you're interviewing at a place, either screening or on campus. Um, and that's really when you want to practice concrete responses to questions about your current research, future plans, your teaching, and your, and your goals. Um, and of course, we're going to emphasize this over and over again, think about your answers from the search committee's perspective. Uh, very similar to the theory of mind tasks that you're all so familiar with um, from your intro to site courses and developmental site courses. Um, always be thinking about what they'll be thinking about and frame your questions and answers accordingly. So if they're going to be really concerned, for instance, um, with whether you're going to come, um, try to tie your answers back in to the fact that, or the reasons why you would accept this offer if it were given to you. Um, if they're trying to gauge whether you could fill a gap or an area of need in their department, then kind of tie your answers back to that area of need. And that's fair game to ask about too when, when you're speaking with, with folks that you're talking to at the universities. So what are the screening interviews for exactly? Um, well, they are the kind of first stage in the selection process. So after a department or a search committee, which is usually three to four people from a department or area, uh, review all of the applications, which are often more than 100 applications per position, um, they're going to zone in on the top 10 to 15 candidates, usually based on their written materials. Sometimes, but not always, including letters of recommendation, which tend to be looked at more closely later in the process. This um, helps decide which usually three to five people are invited for on-campus interviews. And the reason they don't invite everybody is because they're really expensive and they take a lot of time. Um, when, so they, these interviews, we'll talk about this later, can range from one day to three days. Um, so when you think about an entire department dropping everything to interview somebody for three days, that, you know, that can only happen so many times in a semester, um, let alone the costs. Um, and of course, programs are motivated to invite the people who would be successful there and are, there's a strong chance that they would accept the offer. So again, this theme is going to come up over and over again. It's not just about your record, it's about your fit and whether they think you'd go. <laughs> um, and I will say too, usually if you make the first uh, sort of cut and you're being, you're being invited to screening interviews, you've done everything right. <laughs> you know, you are absolutely qualified to do this position. It, at that point, is just a matter of what the department needs at the time. And usually there's more than 15 people who are very qualified. But, um, this may occur over video conference or phone. The vast majority of mine were over video conference. Um, they're usually brief, between 30 and 60 minutes total, um, and mostly they're standardized across candidates. So the first one of these I had felt a lot like a Trier social stress test. There were a panel of people, and they each um, asked me one question um, and never responded to anything I said <laughs> or showed any real emotion. So it was fascinating, um, but also very nerve-wracking. I ended up getting invited to an on-campus interview there, and you never know, you know, based on the screening interview, exactly what they're looking for or how it's going. Um, which isn't all that comforting, but it is reality. Um, and so yes, usually everyone invited for a screening interview has these on paper qualifications for the job they're applying for. Logistical prep for these screening interviews. Um, if it's on video, wear formal clothes, get into character, you know, um, from top to bottom, um, just be uh, complete. Um, if possible, select a neutral background, you know, all of this is if you can, you're, you're stuck with the resources that you have wherever you're, you're living or you're, you're set up at home. Um, check that the lighting uh, is good that time of day, that you're not backlit, so you don't want to be a silhouette in front of the search committee, um, despite the drama that that would present. Uh, ensure strong and stable internet connection to the best of your ability. Consider a headset to reduce risks of um, echoes and background noise. Um, so I'll say up front, I did very few of these things. So it's not required. <laughs> it's just that in an ideal world, you would do all of these things to prep perfectly for the ideal screening interview, but ultimately they're gonna be most concerned with your answers. Um, have a sheet of paper ready for notes and keep a list of points to remember to bring up or questions to ask. So I actually had like a poster board right behind my computer that had bullet points about my research program and bullet points about answers that I had planned in advance. I didn't memorize much, 
I practiced a lot, but all of the answers were literally written down in front of me as I was um, doing these interviews, these, these video interviews. Um, and you know, they, I, put the, I put it right behind my computer so I could see it and reference it without being too conspicuous during the interview. And that worked fine. Um, so give yourself every boost you can um, in being able to hold all that information in your mind. Uh, keep in mind the questions you really want to get to, to ask the committee, et cetera. Uh, practice, please practice. Um, it's so much harder than you expect it to be um, to not ramble, <laughs> um, to keep your questions and answers brief. Um, especially in these brief screening interviews, time is really short, so your answers have to be concise. Try to keep your key answers that you rehearsed to maybe a minute. Uh, because you'll, you know, inevitably go for a little bit longer than you practice or intend. Um, and your communication skills are being assessed here. A lot of people who are applying for these R1 positions don't necessarily have a ton of teaching experience, for example. So how you present your research ideas and how you do if you get invited for a campus interview, your job talk, that's going to kind of stand in, in a lot of cases, for their perception of your capacity as a teacher. So it's really important. Um, that you get those answers concise and clear and compelling. And I'll just jump in. I ended up asking a, a senior faculty member about advice for these kinds of screening interviews. And he had told me that he looked at what he wanted to say about his program of research and he, and he wrote it down. And then he'd have um, his wife practice with him asking different questions without knowing what he wanted to say and seeing how he could fit what he was planning to say into a response for those kinds of questions, just to make sure that he was able to include, um, you know, his his plan statements about how his research fit. And um, it was great advice. It was something I had never even thought about doing. And so now, when I have these kinds of things coming up, I'll I'll take a sheet of paper and I'll write down, make sure I want to say these things, and then um, plan ahead of time to try to figure out how can I use this answer to fit a question that I've been asked. Yeah, Kate, that's great advice. Um, what I would probably add to that is doing that for people who are unfamiliar with your research program is probably the most valuable thing you can do. Um, you know too much about what you do and you think about it too much and you don't know when you're using jargon, even if you think you're catching yourself. Um, so getting the perspective of kind of a, a person with, you know, uh, a lot of education, but maybe not content area expertise, that's going to be your audience for pretty much every interview you have. Um, so practicing with those folks is super, super helpful. Um, you will be asked, why do you want this position and at this institution? Um, and the subtext here is probably, why would you accept this job over other very similar jobs at very similar institutions? Um, so you really want to look through the mission statement of the university, the department, the culture, anything that would make it stand out um, and uh, set it apart from, from other opportunities that you might be presented with. Tell us about your research. Where will you take it next? And that's really important. So whenever people ask about your research program, you don't just want to summarize what you've done. You want to explain the umbrella motivation for your research program and where it's going to carry forward. Um, so future orientation is really important to emphasize. The subtext here is, do you have clear plans for where you're going with all of this? <laughs> um, because once you get there, it's, a, it's kind of a blank slate and you're starting anew with building a lab. Um, uh, does your research program, is it fundable? Um, is it going to involve students sufficiently in the way that their institution tends to involve students? Is it going to make both practical and theoretical contributions to the field? And I will say too, the different departments in different types of schools and programs will differentially value practical versus theoretical contributions. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind in terms of the department culture. Uh, some places I interviewed were really interested with the theoretical uh, motivation for my work. And some were like, okay, how is it gonna help people? So very different kind of perspective. So it's again, helpful to think about who am I talking to? What do they care about? What do they wanna know? Tell us about your teaching experience. What would you be able to teach? This is kind of a trap. So <laughs> um, usually I would answer this with more questions. Um, uh, are you able to fill our department's current teaching needs would be the subtext. So if you don't know their current teaching needs, it's very difficult to answer this question sufficiently. Um, so I would usually respond to that by saying, well, I would, I would be comfortable teaching a lot of different things and I have experience teaching some areas, but I'm curious as to whether there are any particular gaps that you're hoping to fill with this search that I should know about or that would be helpful to consider. 
Um, it's totally fair game to answer in that way. Um, and in fact, it shows that you're being really thoughtful about your response and how you may be able to contribute to the department. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, the answer is never no, never. Even if you have no questions and have no interest and are positive you would decline an offer, it is never no. <laughs> um, because the subtext here is, do you value this interview enough to do your homework and to care? Um, they just want to know that you are putting the effort and the time in. Um, the content of your questions can, in some cases, demonstrate that you did your homework and that you, you know, if you ask about it in, in a university level initiative, for example, that they're really pushing, like a global mental health initiative at the university that they really want to forward. And you, you can ask about how that's going um, and show that you've read their website. But the most important thing here is to just have a question. <laughs> and the other point here is even if you know that this is not a place you likely accept, it can be helpful for other um, places you're negotiating with to know that there are other interviews that you've had or that you're considering. And so um, you don't want to avoid um, getting an offer just because uh, you're not interested in going there. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Gather all the eggs you can in your basket and use them. Um, because even if it's not an offer you would accept, they don't know that. And negotiation for your salary, for your startup is really, really important. And even though as postdocs and graduate students, you're used to being thankful for like any dollar anywhere and any room, you're going to need more than that to be successful as a faculty member. Um, so just remember to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, we already sort of talked about these things. I'm going to go a little quickly so we have enough time for the rest. Um, so understanding the so what of your research. Why does this matter? Um, and again, it may matter because of theoretical contributions that your research will make, or it may matter because of practical contributions. Um, but be clear on what matters to you and also what matters to the department and emphasize that. Um, it's really good to be excited. Um, I got feedback a lot that I was super excited to be talking about the stuff that I work on. Um, usually that was positive feedback, although I'm positive I veered into the more hyperactive territory at some interviews. That definitely happened. Uh, you know, it turned out okay, but be aware <laughs> of when you're maybe pushing the boundaries of how excitable you want to be and present yourself um, if you have that tendency. And I think, you know, we can all be self-aware in assessing that tendency. <laughs> Um, try filming yourself. It's super uncomfortable, but definitely do it. Um, if you have clinical supervision where you're already filmed for your sessions, you'll be used to this hopefully um, already, but um, filming yourself and seeing if you have any kind of habits or, you know, you say um more than you ever thought you did, um, or you use a lot of fillers. Then uh, that's chronic nodders. I'm a, I'm a, I nod too often. So yeah. knowing that by seeing it was really helpful and just trying to tone it down a little bit. And nodding is good. I, I think I prefer too many nods to too few, just because too few makes me anxious, which is why presenting on Zoom in general is just very challenging. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway. Let's keep going. Connect your accomplishments to what you know about the job, the institution, the department needs. Don't be afraid to ask clarifying questions like what their teaching needs are, et cetera. Better to be thoughtful than to be right on the first time. They don't expect you to read their minds. They expect you to do your homework and to be careful about what you're, what you're doing and saying. Express enthusiasm for the institution and job. Again, even if you know you're not gonna take it. It's good practice. Um, and it maximizes your odds of having offers to use for leverage. Um, which really do come in handy when you're negotiating. Um, and also keep in mind that even if you're a student when you're interviewing, even if you're a postdoc, they view you as a colleague or a future colleague, not as a trainee. And that's a really hard mindset to get out of when you've been socialized to be and think of yourself as someone who works under people. Um, but know that when you go into these situations, even if you have to sort of fake it till you make it, they try to see yourself how you know they're going to see you. They're inviting you because they think you're ready to do this job. Um, okay, after the screening interview, I would recommend suggesting uh, uh, sending one thank you note just to the uh, search committee chair, the person who you've been interfacing with to schedule a screening interview um, and say, you know, please extend my thanks and appreciation to all of the committee members or all the people who were at the call. 
Um, this is your last chance to express enthusiasm. You can say, you know, my excitement for the department was just reinforced by our conversation, yada, yada. So there are lots of things you can do, um, even at this stage, but after this, you just wait. Um, and you may wait a day. Um, there was one screening interview where I heard the same day that I would be invited to campus, and there was one where I heard two months later. So that's not comforting, and it is what happens. Um, but just because you don't hear right away doesn't mean you aren't being invited to campus. All right, and I think Kate is going to take it from here. Okay, great. And if you could continue the screen share, that would be fantastic. I will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so you made it past the screening interview, or if you didn't even have one, you just got invited to interview in person. And so um, we experience these as physically in person. Um, who knows with the pandemic if we're going to have in-person interviews anytime soon. Um, so they might be over video conference after all. Um, but usually these are going to be in person and they're going to be physically on campus in the location where the um, where the uh, university or, or college is located. So now you're down to three to five candidates typically. Um, so they've, they've narrowed it. And again, um, if you don't make it to this short list, it, it's hard not to take it personally, but it may have nothing to do with your qualifications, your personality, your intellectual depth or anything. It may be just that fit. And really you don't want to be at a place where it's a poor fit. So um, it can be frustrating and many people go on the job market uh, more than one year. Um, I actually applied uh, when I was um, on internship and didn't, I heard applied well, to three places, I heard crickets. And so I got some more experience and applied again. So that's not an unusual situation. Um, so if you've made it here, this is great. It's a really promising sign that you um, might be a really good fit. And then it's further evaluating that here. So uh, there's going to be a few other people. They might even tell you who else is interviewing. They might not, when, in my case, I ended up getting um, the schedule of the wrong person. So I knew who was uh, one of the other folks applying for the position. Um, so uh, again, they're likely going to be in person. They usually take place over two days. Some will, will pack it all into one day, some spread over three days. Um, and there's multiple components to these interviews. And so when, we, when I talked to Andy about doing this workshop last year, I really thought about this as just being an interview skills kind of workshop. But Jessica helped me to see that, no, the job interview is so many components, which is why we're kind of going through a lot of these details. It's, it's a job talk as part of the interview. And there are lots of resources about a job talk. We could spend an entire, uh, you know, several workshops about a job talk. But that's one piece. There's these one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, which we're going to go into more detail. There's going to be group meals. So this is going out dining with students or with other faculty members. And then sometimes student meetings as well. Uh, additionally, there could be chalk talks. Uh, th that was a common theme this year. A few people reached out to me and said, you know, do you have advice about chalk talks? And it's coming, coming to be more and more common, um, especially at R1 places for this expectation. Um, teaching talks, this is, a, a, um, this is also more common, particularly in teaching oriented um, universities. And then sometimes there's a clinical talk as well, uh, which is going to be easier probably for folks who are doing really um, uh, intervention oriented research for those who are doing more basic um, etiology research can be a little bit more challenging. Okay, so uh, usually they're going to make um, one offer at a time. So after this is over, it's usually it's considered a successful search if they've made an offer and someone accepted. And so um, sometimes they've decided and this happens at and sometimes, you know, the most prestigious places in the country, they'll do searches year after year and, and not make an offer because they're looking for a very specific person. So that's sometimes considered a failed search. Um, most universities are not happy when they have a failed search. They want to find someone to fit this. They don't want to keep doing this year after year after year. They want to find somebody. And so they want to find somebody who will accept it. And so this is why a lot of what Jessica and I are talking about is communicating that you are going to be a good fit for them. And a lot of the questions that I got were really oriented towards, are you really going to come here if you, if you get this offer? Um, and so that's one of the really important things that they're assessing. And sometimes they'll even make two offers. So in my case, um, there were two of us who interviewed the person whose schedule I got, um, Autumn Kujawa, 
Uh, we both were um, uh, offered a, a spot because they decided that they really wanted to not have to pick. So that can happen as well. Um, it's not usual, but it, it does happen. Okay, so um, in terms of preparing for this, this two to three day interview, there's a few things that you should be doing. Um, one is just coordinating um, with someone in the department about how do you get there? Are you gonna drive? Is there a flight? Where are you gonna stay? They have experience in doing this, so they will often be the one who says, this is, this is uh, how it's gonna work. Sometimes they'll book the flights for you, other times you'll be reimbursed. Um, in terms of the job talk, this is something you can be preparing ahead of time. Um, and it takes some time to make an amazing job talk. And this could be the single most important piece of the interview is, is showing the way that you think um, and the way that your research hangs together and what you wanna do next. Andy's book, which you probably have all heard about by now, The Early Career uh, Researcher's Toolbox, has a lot of advice about setting up your program of research so that when you do your job talk, it's crystal clear about you know, the, the flow. Um, so you can start that beforehand. And again, practice this with people in and outside of your area and field. This is something where, while you don't need to memorize it, it's helpful if you just know what you're gonna say when each slide comes up. And so what I literally did was write every word that I planned to say in my notes, and then I, I did a recording of what I planned to say, and I would listen to it as, as if it were a podcast, just walking around um, or on my commutes and really thinking about how does this flow and finding things I might want to change as I was listening to it, but also being really comfortable when I got there that this was not something I was winging. Um, Can I okay. just add one thing yeah. to that? Sure. Um, so I also found this, the process of creating a job talk super informative for me and how I felt like I could best organize my research and thinking around it. Um, you don't have to like know in advance what your job talk is going to look like. I certainly didn't. In fact, when I first came into it, I was like, how am I going to make this make sense? There's like random stuff here that doesn't fit. Um, so I found it extremely useful um, as just an exercise to go through for myself. Um, and it pays dividends. So I'm still giving versions of my job talk when I'm invited to speak places. It serves as a template that you'll use over and over again and that you'll grow from. Um, so it's, it's a nice thing in many ways. Absolutely. And you know, I did some things where I reordered it after giving it feedback. And sometimes people would say, you know, I don't think you should show this line of work because it's kind of distracting and part of your heart, you know, wants to resist that and say, no, but I really, I really love this. But you have to listen to other people's advice because they're more similar to the audience than, than you would be really deep into the work. Okay, so you also want to be prepared for any other expected talks. Um, read the faculty pages, look at the CVs of the folks you're going to be interviewing with, um, look at their recent publications. On Google Scholar, if you look up someone, it shows you the thing that's been cited the most. It's good to know what they've been known for, but it's also good to see what they're doing now. And so if you sort by date, you can see the papers that have come out most recently. And that's usually what people are most excited about, not something they did 10 or 20 years ago, but where they are now. So it's important to just keep a note of that. So to familiarize with everyone you're gonna be meeting with, and then try to do research on the university, the department, the college, the institutes, initiatives, so that you have those things to talk about when they say, do you have any other questions? Um, so you can bring your notes, bring a cheat sheet, have a binder, or you know, one of those fancy leather pleather folders where you can make notes to make sure you ask so-and-so about this thing. That's great. And then in between your meetings, you can just open it up and, and refresh your memory about what you wanted to talk to each person about. You can also pack snacks. Um, I think Jessica said she brought uh, chocolate covered espresso beans just for that little pick me up. You can take trips to the bathroom just to take a deep breath and, and breathe, especially when you find yourself tipping over to that hyperactive part because this is really energizing and can be um, a good time to just take a deep breath and relax or do your power posing, whether that is just a placebo or not, I find it super helpful. Um, and pack snacks because you might not have chance to eat otherwise. Okay, um, general tips, be friendly. This is obvious, but you know, anyone and everyone can be part of the evaluation. The person that's, that's scheduling your hotel, um, they'll report back about if you were unkind to them. So it's good to just be a nice person anyway, but just know you're always on 
um, you're always being evaluated. Um, these days are long. Um, prepare notes and reminders, um, just like that cheat sheet we were talking about. Uh, this is one really big piece of advice that I, that I give to people is that when you're in those one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's not an interrogation. It's not um, the format of someone's going to ask me a question and then I'm going to answer it. That is actually really unpleasant. Um, now that I do, I'm on the other side, it's much more enjoyable when it feels like it's a conversation. Um, and so what I suggest people doing who are used to a question, answer, question, answer approach, to think about uh, a three-step process to practice to help make it more of a conversation. So this might not apply to every single question, but I think it's a good idea to just try to do this in practices. So the three steps are to, after someone asks you a question, to acknowledge something about that question. Oh, that's something that's really been on my mind quite a bit recently. Um, to answer the question in one or two sentences and look for feedback about whether they're interested in what you're saying. And you can elaborate if they're nodding and smiling or you, um, if you know that they might not be as interested anymore, you can then invite their perspective. I'm curious about how you tend to think about this topic. Would you be willing to share that? And that in turn makes it more of a conversation. And a lot of times people feel better at the end of an interview if they thought, oh, we had a really nice conversation rather than they were good at answering the questions that I asked them. So um, again, they're wanting someone to be a colleague. 50 years might be uh, a, a large number, maybe not always true, but in this possible. case, it's possible. And so if you're thinking about someone you're choosing to be around for 50 years, would you rather be somebody who does a good job answering your questions or somebody that you really had a nice, thoughtful conversation about with. And so, you know, you're going to be sitting on committees together. You're going to be voting faculty meetings together. They're looking for a colleague and, and not a student. And so this is a way you can communicate that you're ready to shift to that next level. And one thing I would also say to that is advice that I got that I now give to other people is that people will remember how they felt at the end of that conversation and they probably won't remember what you said. So <laughs> um, if they feel like, wow, I had a nice, 30 minutes just then, that's gonna work in your favor. Um, so the more you can do that, and I think this is a great process for keeping in mind, the better. Great, so um, asking questions shows your interest, but um, I have seen often that folks who want to, who are feeling nervous, want to portray themselves as really knowledgeable and they really know what they're doing and they know their, their stuff. And unfortunately that can backfire because it can give the impression that you think that you are gonna get the offer and you are evaluating them. Of course you are also evaluating them, but a humble confidence approach, which is a real thing I Googled it, is way better than arrogance. So admitting when you don't know things is so much better than giving a wrong answer. Um, so I just wanna um, encourage you to work on um, being open about um, when you do and don't know things, um, and to be curious rather than um, trying to show that they really should hire you because you're so competent and great. And if, if that comes up during your job talk, um, one thing that I found worked better than saying, you know, I'm generally not sure, is saying, wow, I haven't thought about that thoroughly enough. What, what would be your guess? I'm really curious. Um, so if, you know, just bounce it right back to them, um, convey the idea that you are thoughtful and interested and want to push the boundaries of, of, of what you know. Say out loud that you are grateful to have been invited. Again, they've had hundreds or, or more applicants and you made it to the three to five who get invited. Acknowledging that you're grateful to be invited um, and that you're honored to consider being, for being considered to join that program as a sign that, you know, you'd be a nice colleague and that you are really interested in being there. Um, frame your questions for them in a way that allows them to say yes and something positive about their program or university or city. So this is going back to what Jessica was saying about the impression that they feel at the end. If you ask a lot of questions that make them say negative things about the opportunities there or the city, 
um, that doesn't leave them with a, a good feeling and it may make them think that you're not that excited or interested in coming. So examples include, um, are junior faculty able to participate in PhD student recruitment? That's something that most places will say yes to. And so this is just a chance for them to tell you about the way that you would get to participate in that process should you come. Another one would be, what do you most like about living here? Um, and are there any restaurants you particularly like? You know, these are things that you can sort of push the conversation in a positive direction. Um, further, if you have questions about what neighborhoods faculty typically live in, what daycare options are available nearby, if that's relevant for you, can demonstrate that you are seriously considering moving your life to that location, that this is not something you're taking lightly, that you've been looking into what the experience would be if you moved your life there. Okay, so um, questions about the job talk. I think we should maybe move through this sort of quickly. Um, just generally, you know, try not to run over, really, really try not to run over. It's better to go under the allotted time than over, it leaves more time for questions. Um, and I think that the questions in the answer section can be quite, quite fun, actually. Um, pieces that can be tailored to the specific program are to consider whether your work has been inspired by or builds from the work that's actually going on or has been historically going on in that department or work that intersects with others, uh, other work going on in that department. So you may consider acknowledging that directly in your job talk or in your meetings one-on-one -on -one with those who do intersecting work. Um, at the very least, it's possible that those who are sitting in on your job talk will ask you questions about how your um, work builds from others or how you see it um, fitting in with other work that's happening there. And um, it's, you know, people like the idea of finding a collaborator or finding that someone coming in would be someone they could work with and do things with. And so planting the seeds for those potential collaborations is a really nice way to convey your enthusiasm and your respect for the work that's happening there already. Um, okay, so practice in front of groups, uh, Record yourself and talk slowly. Um, and then jargon, that's another thing that we, especially in our own labs, we get used to acronyms. You know, we call our studies by three letters or four letters and um, not everyone is in our head. And so that's a really good chance to, to notice if you're saying things that may not be accessible to everybody. This is just an example day. Um, I grabbed this from the University of Pennsylvania Career Services website. We actually have a link to this whole PowerPoint, which is really helpful as well. Um, it's just packed. It's back to back to back to back. Um, so that's, if you've done internship interviews, it's, it's very similar to that. So just know that you're going to be busy. There are going to be lots of different people that you will meet during the interview. Um, this includes the search committee chair. That's usually the person that invited you and the search committee members. These are all folks who have read your application materials and are excited about meeting you and are involved in the evaluation process um, significantly. So um, for, for those folks, it's particularly important to ask them about what their goals were for the search. You're acknowledging that they have a goal that they're working towards. And by acknowledging that, you might find out more about what, they, what it is the, that they're, the gap they're trying to fill with this search. Um, you're gonna meet with other people in the department or, or in your area. They may attend your talk or not. They may be in your area or not. They may be of any level of um, the seniority ranks. And they may or may not have read your application um, so you want to be ready to talk to them with just, you know, a one or two um, minute summary of your program of research and what you're about. Um, you're going to want to ask them about their work and their experience um, and to be considering avenues for collaboration if they do something that's adjacent or similar to your, your area. You'll likely be meeting with graduate students if you're at a, a doctoral granting institution or undergraduate, undergraduates at the liberal arts college. Um, sometimes uh, they're the ones who are providing you transportation, driving you to and from, or walking you to and from buildings. Um, they might be um, likely to attend your job talk or to join you for a specific breakfast or lunch with students. Um, they are also part of the evaluation process. So um, it's good to find out what their experience is like in the program, see what they like about the program, what they would hope to see improve, so they can see that you're really interested in, if you come, seeing how you can join the program and even make it um, a better place to be for students. You'll likely meet with the department chair. So this is the person who um, may or may not be involved in your search, but ultimately this is the person who will be making you um, the offer and negotiating your startup package. So the dean is really in charge of approving that package. 
and the department chair is this intermediary person between you and the dean. And ideally, they're going to be trying to make sure you get everything you need to be successful if you get an offer there, while also making sure that the requests are within reason to the dean who ultimately needs to, to approve them. Um, so with the department chair, you would want to ask about what does the post-interview process look like? Um, and so you'll have an idea when you might hear, um, hear from them. And then some places you'll meet the dean. I met the dean when I was interviewing at, at Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, they um, usually have a vision for where they want the college to go or have um, particular, uh, particular initiatives or projects of interest. You can ask them about what their goals are or visions are for the, for the college as a whole. Okay, so it's nice to um, be prepared for these um, less formal aspects of the interview. So that includes kind of having a, a jargon-free summary of your research, your elevator pitch about what it is that you do you can deliver quickly. Um, this is a good opportunity to talk about a shared interest. I think food is something that pretty much everybody likes and likes talking about. So I think that's a, a pretty safe topic. You, consider it, you can consider in advance what hobbies or interests you're comfortable sharing um, with others. Um, and you can ask them about their interests outside of work. So this is your chance to show that you're a person as, as well as a, a scholar. Um, okay, and uh, we'll, yeah, we can make sure that we, the PDF links can, can get to you. Um, and then this is also a chance for you to show your interest in living in that place. So if you looked up you know, uh, 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 hobbies or activities that fit your interests that are nearby, you can highlight that you're really excited about the hiking trails because you love to go hiking and you've hiked the Appalachian Trail or whatever it is. Um, in terms of just quick things to say about socializing and meals, um, you know, don't flirt with anyone. Um, uh, avoid overconsumption of, of food and alcohol. When we're nervous, sometimes we do things that we later regret. This is a good time to be really thoughtful ahead of time about, you know, whether you're gonna accept an alcoholic drink and how many you feel comfortable. Um, consuming in the context of, of a pseudo-professional social meal. Um, and then try to keep the conversation positive. So avoid saying bad things about your training program or other places you've interviewed. It's just not a good look. Okay, so one thing that comes up is people are not allowed to ask you certain questions. Um, but they really want to know the answer. And so there might be ways to try to find out either directly or indirectly about a number of personal things. Um, those include, uh, are you partnered? Are you married? Uh, what does your partner do? Would they be willing to come here? Um, are you, uh, is, your other, is your partner an academic? Would we have to find a position for them? Do you have children? Are you planning to have children? Um, those are things that, um, that they're not really allowed to ask. Um, but they often do want to know. Um, another thing is that uh, they want to know, would you be willing to move here in a place that may have uh, a different racial, ethnic, or religious group reputation or background or reputation for political beliefs that may or may not differ from yours or has a, a certain number of single people if you're um, wanting to be partnered? They're really trying to gauge how likely is it that you, there would be a barrier that would keep you from accepting an offer. Um, so you might understand why they want to know those things, and it's up to you whether you want to share that information. So whatever you decide, we suggest that you consider ahead of time and practice how you want to respond to those types of questions, direct or indirect. Um, so it's, it can be, um, if you're planning not to talk about it, but you haven't planned about how you want to say you're not comfortable talking about it, it can be flustering and frustrating. So Thinking about things ahead of time is really helpful for planning how to address these, these potential issues. As, as one example of that, um, the way that I decided to approach this was I decided to kind of circumvent it by making sure I mentioned it up front. <laughs> um, so by saying, for example, that, and I was wearing an engagement ring on all my interviews, so it was very obvious like what my situation was. Um, that I was only considering jobs uh, near major hospitals where my um, soon-to-be husband could get a residency. 
Um, so that that was just off the table and they knew both that I was committed to certain places for certain reasons and what the situation was for me. That made it easier because then I knew like they wouldn't ask <laughs> after that. Um, although kids also do come up if, if you're female. Um, I can't speak to men's experience on the job market as much, but yes. Oh, okay. um, oh I, I got a private question, but I'll address it at the end. Okay, other potential hard questions that are good to, to get prepared for is they might ask you in your meeting with the department chair, what would a startup package look like for you? And you might be thinking, oh, I haven't even thought about how much I would need to get my lab up and running. So once you get a job interview, it's a good time to start thinking about what resources you would really need to make your program of research a reality in another place um, and start considering this, you know, and start putting together, um, you know, a, a, an Excel sheet or a spreadsheet that um, you can use to start thinking about the resources you would need. If you need an MRI with um, certain uh, capabilities, then, you know, it's realistic that you would say, I would love to have scan time as part of my, my package. Or, Do you have a relationship with the scan center here or something like that? But thinking about, um, in particular, how much money you might need to be successful, um, uh, that's something that could, be, that could come up. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to recruit your population of interest here? Would you be able to run the kind of studies that you want to do here? Um, you need to be able to think about that um, and respond thoughtfully, and that might include doing research on the demographics of that area so that you can be realistic about whether or not you can carry on a planned program of research there. Um, what classes would you be willing and able to cover? Um, again, I think it's good to be open. Um, saying that you'd be open to introductory level courses, that's often what uh, needs to be covered in particular statistics. Um, but saying you're open to introductory courses or to ask about um, the, what is needed right now in the department is a good way to go about um, responding to that. And then sometimes they'll want to know, would you be able to start in the fall or are you going to ask to defer your date? That was something I was really nervous about being asked. It turned out that, that asking to defer was considered a good thing up at the place that I was interviewing, um, but I wasn't sure. So I tried to just say, I, you know, I, I could start in the fall. I think it'd be great to finish out my postdoc so I can get the rest of the training I've been planning before I start my own lab. Um, so those are things that you might expect that could come up. And that usually depends whether they're open to it depends on the immediacy of the teaching needs that you're filling. Um, at larger research oriented universities that tends on average to be less of a big concern than at smaller teaching focused universities. Okay, so Here. there are other talks that you might be asked to prepare. We just included some notes here with some suggested guidance for um, where you can find more information about each one of these. Um, uh, I, yeah, and, and here's some other resources. The PowerPoint from the University of Pennsylvania Career Services. I mentioned um, our job materials, including our slides that we used. I'm sure there are typos in my full application, but that's what they saw. So you'll just see what, they sub what I submitted back in fall 2016. And it looks like the links weren't working on the, on the PDF that I uploaded. So we'll find a way to, to get um, the HTML to work. Yeah, we can, we can post just the PowerPoint version, maybe. I don't know. Some technology solution. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good forum.